Hey guys, welcome to Objective 2.3, Enforcing Encapsulation. Today's objectives are using access modifiers, using properties, and using explicit interface implementation. In this lesson, we're really going to just talk about um, certain aspects of these three concepts. For example, in access modifiers, we're going to talk about uh, when we should use which access modifiers, which is the most appropriate. When should we hide data with the private, uh, with the private access modifier, and things like that. With properties, we'll we'll talk about um, when do we want to use a property. You know, what what are the benefits of using a property over just maybe a field, a public field. So, what, what why do I want to use properties, and what are properties? Uh, we'll discuss and then we'll also briefly talk about what this idea is an explicit interface implementation all right so let's get started so let's first dive into access modifiers let's go ahead and talk about what are access modifiers and we'll we'll go over the basic um or well all the the basic access modifiers that we can use so first is what is an access modifier and it acts the easiest way to think of an access modifier or understand an access modifier is that an access modifier allows us to control access to specific members or class um, so for example if we have a class let's say and we have some kind of field some kind of data or member wise variable in this class we can use access modifiers to control access. So depending on how we mark this field, certain you you only be able to access this field in certain circumstances depending on the access modifier that's specified. Now, when we don't specify an access modifier, all situations have default access modifiers, and it, it just depends um, where we are and to what our default access modifier. Um, goes to as you can see both these this main method and class declarations both do not have an explicit access modifier so they default to their default access modifiers okay so the first access modifier that I want to talk to I mean talk about is the public access modifier now this is probably the most common one that you've seen if you are new to access modifiers the public access modifier if I specify this on some um, class or member or some kind of thing um, that thing or whatever I'm specifying it on is accessible by everything uh, it has no restricted access it's open to the public everyone can access it so for example if I want to make this class program public I would just specify it public as the access modifier before it and now it says public class program saying that everything can access it there are no restrictions public it means it's open to all no restrictions so that's the first access modifier the second most common access access modifier that we you've probably seen is private private specifies that whatever you mark private is only accessible by the class itself okay sorry about that those were my dogs and they were barking okay um, so private um, specifies like I was saying that whatever you mark private can only be accessed by um, the containing type or what what uh, what whatever is containing so for example uh, let's go ahead and so we can see this let's go ahead and just make a, a, a sample class so I'm going to add a new class and I'll call my class a uh, student so inside my student class let's go ahead and just um, we'll give it a student a an age a grade and a name now right now these three data uh, variables or members uh, access modifiers I did not specify so that they all defaulted to their default values but I can specify them anything I want 
So I'm going to make age public, grade public, and then I'm going to make the name private. So now by doing this, like I said, public means that it has no restrictions and that it's open to everyone, whereas private is that it's only accessible by the type itself or the containing type. So that means that the only thing that can access the name of this is this student itself or inside this. So if I wanted to access it, maybe if I had a function called test, uh, if I had a function called test, I could access the name of this object by accessing by just doing this dot name or name whatever alright so I could change the value of name no problem inside of this class because it's private it's local it's only can be accessed by the class itself now to prove this let's go ahead and create an instance of this student and inside of this we'll be able to see if I go s dot I get two things I get age Grade and test also because look we made test public, so we can we we're only seeing the public members age and grade are only showing because they're both public. If I were to make grade private also, now when I go back here, now we only see age. So that's showing you that anything that's marked private is only accessible by the class itself. Private is not accessible by another class. So I'm creating this student outside of the class uh, definition. That means I can't access any of its private members. It's private to itself. We only can access members that we can. And the only one we know right now is public. Now, there's really a lot to do with this, this concept of... Um, data hiding, you, I guess you could say, with using the private access modifier to hide data. Um, there's a there's a whole kind of intellectual concepts that you need to understand when it comes to you know when sh I should hide which data and and wh why I should show certain data and, and things like that. And we'll get into that more when we talk about properties. And we'll so we'll touch upon the private access access modifier some more. Okay, so the next access modifier that I'm going to talk about is the protected access modifier. Now, the protected access modifier uh, is almost identical to the private. Where, so you can think of protected as private, essentially, right? So that's the first thing you understand with that. Protected is private, right? So anything that's marked protected can only be seen within the containing class but there's just one more thing Pr protected is private but it can also be seen um, in derived classes so it's so protected is the same thing as private but it also includes derived classes so whenever you see protected you should just think of inheritance right away and if you can think of inheritance and, and connect inheritance with protected then you'll be able to remember that protected is okay private and it deals with inheritance so that derived classes can still see it so let's go ahead and do an example with that so we have the same setup but let's just do another class let's say class I don't know I'm just gonna call it test class I really don't know and test class derives from student so inside this test class now let's go ahead and create just another test function inside of this text function if I go this dot what can we see that's the question and as we can see right now we can only see age because age is public grade and name are private right so we can't see that's only within the containing class but if I mark these pro or at least one if I make grade protected that means it's private to end but also derived classes can see it also so now if I go this dot now we can see that grade being shown. So now we have access because it's protected. But still, if I go out here and if I create a uh, test class and go C dot, now I do not see any protected members because I'm not inside the um, derived class. So I only can see the public ones. Here I can only see the public or protected so far. 
that that grade is protected and then inside of student I can see the private ones also so that's so far public is everyone private is the containing class protected is the containing class and all derived classes okay another access modifier is internal internal now this is pretty easy to remember it's not that common I think actually by default if you don't specify a class I'm pretty sure class is default to the access modifier of internal and internal is simply um, uh, limiting the whatever you're remarking it as internal to the current assembly so by marking something internal that means the entire assembly has access to it. Now, for this, you have to know what an assembly is. Um, but I mean, for your most part, you could think of it, like when we're making a project, you could think of this as our, our well, this project is an assembly, has an assembly. Um, but I mean, a little bit more in details is an assembly. Assembly is either a exe or a dll so when we compile we get an exe or dll that contains a manifest file and that 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 is an assembly um, i don't really want to go into too much details with that but you could think of i don't know if you really want to know what assembly is i would just google it but you could think of your current project as an assembly that's a good way to think of it um, so just think of that as an assembly unless you want to get into more details and do some more research. Um, but yeah, that, that's an assembly. So the internal access modifier limits whatever you're doing to the current assembly. Okay. And the last access modifier that I'm going to talk about briefly is protected internal. Now, this is simply the two access modifiers that we went over put together so protected internal is a protected meaning that it's limited uh, to derived classes and internal uh, limited to the current assembly but with protected internal it's either or so protected internal is limited to the current assembly or derived type so if you mark something protected internal whether you have two things it could be whether it is in the current assembly that's good or if it's of a derived type if those it's if either or of those two things are true then the whatever has this access modifier of protected internal will be visible to whoever is using it so protected internal is if it's limited it's limited to the current assembly or any of its derived or a derived type that the derived type is from the protected and the assembly is from the internal so the five access modifiers that we just went over are public internal protected protected internal and private private is the most restrictive public is the least restrictive and so out of, out of all five however I, I would say public protected and private are the most common ones that you'll you'll probably use okay so now that we talked about uh, access modifiers and the basic examples of them let's go ahead and talk about some things with mar with data hiding making things private and this concept of properties you know what are properties and why should we use them so let's just start off really quickly so if anyone is coming from another programming language and they do not know what properties are yet they probably do already know what they are but they just never seen it uh, seen it so in, in let's say we have a language like C++ or Java two languages that I'm just familiar with um, let's say I have a class and I want and I have some kind of um, private data inside this class 
But I, I, I still want users to be able to get this information from this class, but I want it to be in a controlled way where they can't edit it without me knowing about it or, or getting the value if they're not allowed to. So I want to control this access to my private data in, in my classes in, these, in C++ or Java, but how do I do it? So in those languages, I would create get and set functions I would say I would create a function called I don't know get ID and set ID get ID would get the value of the ID depending on what code I have in that function to control um, to control access that would all be done in there and if I had set ID the code that I want to control setting the value of it I could put into there so if I can put code like um, checking if the person trying to change the data is actually allowed to change the data if they have enough or high enough access code or, or something like that um, so that's where I can do that in the get and set functions so languages like Java and C++ I have to go out and build these get and set functions to control access to my private data now in C sharp we can do that also we can go ahead and create get and set functions if we really want to but in C sharp Microsoft created uh, this concept of properties which are simply that they're simply get and set functions you can actually think of a property as a function because it is a function if you when we compile a property which we'll get to in a second and if we examine the intermediate language code of this property it actually is um, in the intermediate language code is shown as a function so a property is just a fancy C sharp um, syntactical feature that we have in C sharp when we compile it to that lower language called intermediate language or Microsoft intermediate language um, it becomes a function just like how it is in other programming language get and set functions that's all a property is. A property is a get and set function for some kind of private data, but it also, it, the syntax for it is easier and shorter. So that's why we use it in C Sharp. It's easier to use, it's faster and shorter. And we can treat, um, because it's not a function, we don't actually have to make the function call, um, even though it really is behind the scenes, I guess, sort of speak. Um, but when we interact with the property, we don't actually put like print the parameters or parentheses in. We just treat it as if it's like a, a variable or a field, but it really has control. So we're going to talk about uh, that a little bit and talk about you know what are some features or, or uh, not not features but um, performance gains by using this uh, example of a property. So let's go ahead and just make a property first. Uh, and I'll explain it a little bit and then we'll get into these a little bit more complicated uh, details. So we're going to go ahead and modify our student class for this example. And I'm not going to go into like, I don't, this may not make logical sense for a student what we're about to do, but um, I'm just trying to show the example of, you know, what a property is rather than sitting here thinking of a perfectly uh, logical example I don't know um, but this if you understand it it doesn't matter whether it makes sense or not for a student so what I want to do is I want to create a student class that um, they're they have a grade in an age and a name I guess actually I know I want to take out the name they have a grade in an age and essentially what I want to do is I want to control access to um, this grade this grade field. I'm going to make it pro uh, private here. And we're going to have, uh, I guess I'll leave the age with that for, for now. So, what I want to do is I want to be able to, if someone is trying to retrieve the value of the age of this class or the whatever instance it is, I mean, I'm saying this wrong, sorry. If, if we want to try to retrieve the grade of this specific instance of this student, um, I want to just m do a check and make sure that if the student is over the age of, uh, say, 15, then their grade can be released to wh whoever's trying to see it. If they're not 15 years old, then the grade information is confidential and, and they can't see it. So that's what that's our setup right there. We're not... Uh, 
well, I'm going to put in a set function so people can change it just so we can see it. But you have to be over maybe 21 to change someone's grade or something. I don't know. In reality, they would have to be a teacher or something like that, and that would be, make more sense. But I just want to show, like I said, show the example of a property. So that's what I want to do. I want to make a, a, a program that controls access to this private data depending on their age and whether or not it should release the information about this grade. So the first thing I want to do is I'm just going to make a um, constructor and it's going to take in an int age and an int or a double grade. Sorry about that. Double grade. And I'm just going to set the values of the private data right here. So this dot age equals A and this dot uh, grade equals G. So that's what my constructor does. So now that I have that. I want to go ahead and make this property. So a property is very similar to a um, variable de uh, declaration. So I have my grade. I want to make a property for this. So my property has to be public because this is what's accessible by the the public. Um, they get to see this, and this vi this property will control access to my private grade because this is my private grade is the internal workings of this class, and I don't want them to access it directly I want them to go through my property because my property will control the access to it for me so it's gonna be public double grade I have to make a new variable this is my new property and then I'm putting in this block to show that I'm making a property this is also like I said uh, this is really behind the scenes a function call so inside of this I need to put two blocks a get block and a set block and, and this is pretty straightforward. The get block is for getting the value of our private data, and the set block is for setting data, um, to be setting values to our private data. But by doing it this way, in, in this get and set, we can control access to this private data, and we can make sure that no one is changing our data to certain values that aren't realistic. Maybe we'll do that in our set function, or things like that. But like I said, the first thing I want to do is I want to just make sure that no one can get the value of the grade unless the student is above age. So I'm going to say if the age of the student, let's say, is greater than or equal to 15, then I'll only return the grade. If they're not greater than or equal to 15, then I'll just write to the console saying, I want to say, this student is too young to release any information so that's what I'm gonna put in there and then I'll, I guess I have to return a double so I'm just gonna say return zero so but we'll get this output right here so this, this is if if they're less than it will just return a zero so that the grade will be a zero um, so that's our get portion in our set portion I'm going to say if the person, um, uh, actually, I don't know. I'm just going to say that anyone can change someone's grade, but they have to change it to a, a good value. So um, there is a, a special keyword that is attached to the set, um, the set blocks, and it's called value. Value is whatever is being passed in to this property. Uh, so what what they're trying to change the value of the property to. So I'm going to say if value is less than uh, or equal to zero, um, obviously I'm not going to set the value then. I, mean, I guess I might as well also just write a little message saying that this value is not valid. This is not a valid value for a grade so you they can't have something less than zero as a grade so that's a little check that I'll put in and then else this means that it is a valid grade I'm gonna say that grade with a lowercase is my private data equals the value whatever is being passed in so this is my property right here like I said it's just a function you could think of in, 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 in different languages, if I wanted to do the same exact program, I would just make a get function and a set function, get grade and set grade. But in C Sharp, it's just easier because we just use a property and everything is built into it at once. So now that we have our student, let's go ahead and create 
a few students s1 equals new student we'll say that this guy is only 10 years old but he has let's say I don't know a 4.0 he's right he's very smart um, and then we say student s2 equals new student and this guy is 18 and he has a 3.5 so we should be able to see his grade so let's go ahead now and display both of their grades. So console.write line S1. As you can see, grade, this is our public one. See with a capital G? That is our property. Our lowercase one is private and is hidden. We're using the lowercase one for our internal workings behind the scene, but we're only showing our public one to the public because we, we are controlling access, it, access to it in our properties. So S1.grade, and you can see it's a little wrench symbol, which represents a property. So I'm going to show S1.grade and, and S2.grade. So the S1.grade, let me put in a message, let's see. S1.grade. Uh, S2's grade. So in, in S1's grade, we should get a message saying that they're too young to release any information. And, and in S2, we should actually see the, the 3.5. So let's go ahead and run this. Okay. So, okay, I didn't even think about that. But so this is what's happening. And everything worked fine. So we could we could change this a little bit though. Um but so what's happening is when we try to access the grade of S1, what happens is we get this student is too young to release any information. That is what S1 is saying. If we let's go ahead and just take out S2 so we can see it line by line. So S2, let's go ahead and run that. So it says this student is too young to release any information, and then it returns zero. So S1's grade is zero. So what it's saying is, okay, this student's too young, I'm not gonna release any information, so I'm setting the grade to zero. And that's why it's zero. I could make it uh, let's say if I return a negative one like if this was a real program that would look more realistic like saying okay You don't have access to their grade. I'll make it a negative one I could also just do an, an if statement checking You know if the grade is not equal to negative one then display the grade if it is then we know it would not valid to see it But whether or not it's still working our property because behind the scenes however that 4.0 is still stored in memory. This four, I passed that 4.0. The grade of this that this 10 year old child is still stored in this private data. But when we try to access it through our property, he's too young, and then it's hidden. The grade is hidden. We return a negative one, and we write out that message so that they get no value. The grade is hidden. Um, so if I run this again, so I I don't get to see their grade because they're too young. Now, if I do S2, however, S2, he's 18. I can release all the information I want. So as you can see, S2 grade is a 3.5. That's released perfectly. What happens is it comes into the property. It says if the grade is greater than equal to, I mean, if the age is greater than 15, then just show the grade for real. I can put a negative 1 here also if I wanted to. Now, we'll always just show, show negative 1. So that's where the actual value is being dumped, this return grade right there. So that's the get portion. Now, if I want to use the set portion, I gotta set the value of it. So let's go ahead and try to set S2's grade by going, I don't know, S2.grade equals, let's say, f uh, 4, no, 3.8. He got it a little bit better. So now I changed his grade. Everything works fine. No message. He got a 3.8. My setter worked, and then it, then it displayed the 3.8. What happens was it comes into the setter, it does this check that was false, so it just sets the grade equal to that 3.8 that's being passed in as a value. If I, if I, but let's say I make it a 0. Remember, you can't set the grade to 0 or maybe a negative. Let's do a negative 5. If I run this program now, as you can see, it says this is not a valid value for a grade. Negative 5 is not valid a uh, value. Uh, valid so we don't set the grade and as you can see s2 it's great is still that 3.5 it stayed as the 3.5 because we didn't modify it all we did was when we got into this error we set this error message and then we returned and we never set grade equal to value this is our private data it stayed the same from our constructor beforehand so we didn't change it at all
So that this is the basics of properties. So we went over one reason why we would want to use a property and and that reason is like I said to protect our private data. If we want to control our private, private data and make sure that wacky values aren't being set on our private data because that private data is what we need to use in our class. That's our back end. That's what we use for, you know, mathematical equations or whatever our class is performing. So we got to make sure that 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 values are proper and the only people who are seeing it are the people who need to see it. So based off of properties, the one bonus is that we can control access to our private data. We can control who sees it and we can control who sets it. We can control what values can be set and things like that. But always remember, a C-sharp property is a function. A C-sharp property is the same thing as a C++ or Java get uh, function or a set function. Uh, in C-sharp, it's just easier because we have properties, but we can also use get and set functions as well. Another benefit, however, that may not be as uh, easy to see is um, is that because our, um, now this is a little abstract thinking, because our property, let's go back to our property, is public, right? The users who are interacting with our, our classes or our objects can only see the public data, which is this grade. And that will stay the same. So the return type of this is a double right now. So that's all it needs to return. But our private data doesn't have to, it doesn't say anything about that, right? Our private data is hidden from the user. So our private data doesn't have to be a double, it, hypothetically. It, it doesn't have to be. Um, we could make it maybe a, uh, I don't know a double array, and if we if we had our grades a double array hypothetically, this may not be the best example for this. If we had our our our, our private data a double array, but we kept our public table uh, our public data uh, a double, it would still work if in our get and set functions we just accessed a specific element in our our private array and displayed that instead. So we wouldn't be displaying or returning the whole grade, but we would return, you know, maybe like index five of it. And what my point is is that um, the internal workings of our class, you know, the internal workings, our private data, doesn't have to be known by the user. We could be doing anything we want behind the scenes, as long as a double is being returned from this property. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter that our private data is a double. It could be anything that we wanted, just that we satisfied the property's need. And even if we changed the, the private data behind the scenes, if we changed that data type, as long as we don't modify the property, every other programmer who uses our, our code won't have to change their code. They could they could have code written a year beforehand and leave that code and if we changed the private data of our grade hypothetically and we made it all work, they wouldn't have to modify their code whatsoever. It, they could leave it and it would work perfectly. This is kind of uh, kind of the idea of encapsulation uh, that uh that we are hiding or the inner workings of the class to the user and that we can make changes to the inner workings without affecting um, the outside interface of the class and without affecting other users codes who are using our stuff because the private data is private we can change it however we want as long as the property is happy everyone is happy Okay, the last thing I want to talk about properties before we move to the last topic, which will be really quick, is that in C Sharp, we can define properties like this, but there is also another type of property that we can use that's really a, a shorthand um, that is only really added because it was uh, it's so commonly used, and it's an auto-implemented property. An, an example of an auto-implemented property, which will make age an auto-implemented property, is public int 
age get set. Essentially what's going on here is as you can see we have this get and set but in the get and set we aren't specifying anything. What happens behind the scenes is that a private member variable called age or whatever it's called is created for us and by default this get and set will be just getting and setting that that private data behind the scenes. Now the reason why we have this is just so that um, people like using properties um, so by doing an auto implemented property you know it's fine to leave it the way it is but it's really easy that if we want to add changes to the get and set portions we can just quickly go in and, and modify it really quickly it's really an easy kind of thing or we can also do some kind of fancy stuff like if I wanna make the getter private meaning that uh, this is really gonna be a uh, actually no it would probably be better if I made this set private so by doing like private set, that means that only it, the the value of the property or the private data can be set with inside the class. It, it only, this is essentially now a read only property. But yeah, so an auto implemented property is just a you could think of it as a field or some kind of member field that's created for you behind the scenes, and the property is just the public portion of it, and it has to get set, but it's empty. So you can, if you want. It just makes it easier to go back and fill it in really quickly. That's the point of the, uh, the, this auto implemented property. So the last thing I'm going to talk about really quickly is this concept of using explicit interface uh, interface implementations. Now, interface interfaces haven't been covered yet in this um, in this series of videos. That's why I don't want to talk about it too much, but the author of the book really emphasizes on the fact that he he wants to just go over this because it talks it, it regards the concept of encapsulation. So essentially, an interface, just really quickly, an interface is a um, uh, is an object that can be implemented. So, so a class can implement this an, an interface. Let's say. And when you implement an interface, it just specifies that you must um, implement everything that the interface says to implement. It just it's like a security kind of mechanism. So if you implement an interface, you know that that class has to implement all those functions that the in, that the interface specifies. So based off of that, there's I'm hoping that you guys know more about interfaces so that you understand this because this is what the book goes over. So if I insert. Um, so when I implement an interface, I have to explicitly, I have to implement the functions that the interface that the interface says to implement. So I can just implement them in the code and and just do it like that. And, and let's say within the interface said implement a function called hello. If I just go in and make a function called a hello in my class that's implementing that interface, that will be fine. But I could also explicitly implement the interface, and by what I mean by that is when I do it that way, I specify the interface's name first, followed by the name of my method. So I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick example of this, and talk about and show what I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and create an interface. New item, interface, and I'm going to call my interface. Um, I test. Uh, I test. And in I test, I'm just going to specify a function called public. Uh, on, what am I doing? There's no access modifiers. V uh, void hello world. So that's what an interface has. I'm not going to go into too much detail with interfaces yet, but if you know what they are, this is what it is. So my interface says that anything that implements this interface must have a function called hello world. So now if I go student implement I test, right? Let's go ahead and just get rid of uh, this. I don't want anything. So I have my student implements I test. If I go ahead and compile this code, I'm getting an error. And it says that my student does not implement the member hello world. And the reason why is because I didn't implement hello world. Student implements I test, meaning it has to implement every function or member that I test says. Let's go hello world 
and now let's try to recompile it and everything. Uh, wait, what? Oh, I spelled it wrong. Recompile it. Everything should be happy. Okay, blah blah. blah. I don't. I don't care about this. These are just stupid errors. Let's try that one more time. Oops. Rebuild. Okay, everything is happy. So we implemented the uh, the function of our interface. Now, if I take this away, and I, I think if I right-click on here, I can go to Implement Interface, and I can Implement Interface or Implement Interface explicitly. If I do this one, it simply does what we just did. Public Void Hello World, and it throws in a non-implemented uh, exception. But, however, I could also implement it explicitly. And notice how what happens when I do it explicitly, like I said before. It, it specifies, it prefixes the hello world with the name of the interface. So it's really, it's getting specific. Now the reasons, there's a bunch of reasons why you would want to do this. Um, maybe one reason is that you already have a function in student called hello world. But you need it, you have to implement this other one for this interface. Then you could do an explicit implementation and the interface will still be happy. And then you can have both functions. Now, the problem with this is, let's go ahead and create a student now. Student s equals new student s dot. What is the problem? I do not see a hello world function. Even though I just implemented it right here, if I compile the code, I'm, that's just errors from there, but this student class is happy. There are no errors. Then how come this hello world is not working? And the reason why is because of this concept, the reason why the author wanted to show this, and, and this concept that it works with encapsulation. Essentially, if we implement in interfaces functions um, explicitly, let's say, um, we can we can hide members. So this hello world function is really part of the class student. Student has a hello world function, but it's just hidden to the user. I can't see it right away, and the only way I can see it is if I if I access the variable through the eyes of the interface. So because I'm specifying it explicitly as I test, I can only access the function through the eyes of the interface. So because student is an I test, I can say I test I don't know, student two equals s. I'm essentially saying s two. Uh, no, I'm essentially saying look at student s as as an I test. Look at it as through the eyes of I test. And by doing it this way. I'm still looking at the same memory. S2 is pointing at student in memory. It's the same memory. Um, nothing happened there. There's no new memory being allocated. I'm just looking at it through the eyes, or well, I'm looking at it through the variable of I test. So now if I go S2, now we can see that hello world uh, function call. I did not make a new func a class. I did not make change anything. I did not allocate any new memory. I'm just looking at the, the student through the eyes of the interface. And that by looking through it as through the eyes of the interface, I can now see um, the hello world function because I'm looking at it as an eye test interface. So now the hello world shows. If I run this, I'm gonna get that not implemented exception throw. As you can see, not implemented exception and the reason is because I'm calling hello world hello world is simply throwing this exception if I take it out nothing will happen now as you can see so that's what it, it, it and if you guys want to see more with this cause I really I know I went really fast and the reason is because I didn't go over interfaces so I don't feel comfortable doing this until I go over interfaces so um so yeah uh, it, when you implement an an an, uh, an interface explicitly, you can only access the members of the that are were explicitly implemented through the eyes of the interface itself. They're kind of hidden behind the scenes, and that's a way that we can hide things. Um, so if you ever want to do that, this is the way to do it.
So that is it for this lesson. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. We went over access modifiers, properties, and this quickly example of encapsulation with explicit interface implementations. If you guys have any questions, be sure to leave me a comment and I try my best to get to them all. I know I haven't posted a video in, in this specific series in a while. I've been extremely busy with other things and hopefully I'll be able to start making videos more weekly on a weekly basis. Um, I've been, like I said, extremely busy with other work. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hope you guys enjoy this video. Um, be sure to stay tuned for what's the next one objective 2.4 creating and implementing a class hierarchy so we'll talk about oh yeah so in that one we'll talk about design and implement interfaces create and use base classes and use some of the standard.net framework interfaces so that's what we'll talk about in the next objective which you guys probably are kind of excited for this looks like an interesting topic has lots of stuff to talk about okay so yep yeah, that's it uh, thanks for watching and like I said if you have any questions be sure to leave some comments thanks